The gunnery system of the Boeing B-29 Super Fortress marked a groundbreaking advancement in heavy bomber defense. Introduced in July 1943, the Super Fortress met America's strategic need for a long-range, high-altitude bomber. Designed in 1938, it surpassed previous bombers in speed, range, and payload, and was intended primarily for use in the Pacific Theater. It could fly at a combat ceiling of 36,000 feet, carry up to 20,000 pounds of bombs, cruise at 230 miles per hour, and reach a top speed of around 350 miles per hour, with an effective range of about 4,000 miles when fully loaded. These capabilities exceeded those of any bomber in existence at the time. The B-29 also influenced U.S. military strategy in the Pacific. With the Marshall, Gilbert, and Solomon Islands under American control, military planners focused on the Marianas Islands rather than the heavily fortified Japanese Caroline Islands. The ability of the B-29 to reach the Japanese mainland from Saipan, Tinian, and Guam, located 1,500 miles away, was a key factor in this decision. Technologically, the B-29 introduced several innovations. It was the first aircraft to feature a heated and pressurized crew cabin, significantly improving crew comfort and performance while reducing fatigue. This allowed it to operate at altitudes above the reach of enemy fighters. It was also the first bomber to use two-wheel tricycle landing gear, offering better stability during landings compared to previous bombers like the B-17 and B-24. Among its most remarkable features was the advanced gunnery system, which set it apart from all other bombers. The aircraft was equipped with a General Electric Type II CFR-55B, one Central Fire Control System, CFC. This system integrated all defensive weapons into a single coordinated network, replacing the traditional setup of independently operated guns. It included five gun sites, five remotely controlled turrets, five targeting computers, and an electric gun switching mechanism. Each turret was remotely operated from a sighting station, with firing trajectories calculated by targeting computers linked to each station. Two turrets, one above and one below the forward fuselage, were positioned just behind the front pressurized crew compartment, which housed the navigator, flight engineer, pilot, and co-pilot. Similarly, the rear section had upper and lower turrets positioned ahead of the tail fin. The fifth turret was in the tail section, aimed rearward. The B-29 had a crew of 11, including five gunners. The top, right, and left side gunners had designated positions, with the side gunners operating from blisters on either side of the fuselage. The bombardier also served as the nose gunner when not performing bombing runs, seated in the nose ahead of the pilots. The fire control officer, or top gunner, operated from a tall chair in the central pressurized section, while the tail gunner sat alone in the pressurized aft section. Primary control of each turret was assigned to a specific gunner. Through a system of electrical switches, secondary gunners could take over if needed, either independently or jointly with the primary operator. The nose gunner typically controlled both forward turrets, with side gunners capable of managing the lower forward turret. The top gunner had secondary control of the upper forward turret and primary control of the rear upper turret. The tail gunner had exclusive control of the tail turret. The fire control officer oversaw the entire gunnery operation, ensuring coordination via the aircraft's interphone system. The gun system included fire interrupter cams that prevented all but the tail-mounted guns from firing into the aircraft's wings or tail. However, it was possible for guns to mistakenly fire into other bombers in formation, particularly if they were aimed during a gunner changeover. Each turret was fitted with two air-cooled Browning M 2.50 caliber machine guns. Later models added two extra .50 caliber guns to the upper forward turret to counter frontal attacks. Gunners were trained to fire in short bursts and wait three seconds between bursts to prevent the barrels from overheating. Overheating could lead to accidental discharge or catastrophic failure due to thermal ignition although up to 25 rounds could be fired in a burst.
A cooling period of 15 seconds was required afterward, which felt prolonged during combat. Early B-29s were also equipped with a 20mm cannon in the tail section. While it couldn't fire independently, it worked in tandem with the .50 caliber machine guns and used the same aiming system. Despite being lighter than the .50 caliber rounds, the 20mm shell packed about three times the punch. Each gunner used a manually operated sight with a 2 by 3 inch glass lens, electrically linked to the CFC system, to aim and fire the weapons. The gunner used glass optics equipped with two movable sky filters that allowed clear vision in near total darkness and helped detect enemy aircraft even when they were approaching from the direction of the sun. A reticle, consisting of a circle of dots surrounding a central dot similar to a rifle scope or a camera viewfinder, was projected onto the optical glass by a reticle lamp with adjustable brightness. Before adjusting the target size knob on the gun sight from 35 to 150 feet to match the wingspan of an enemy aircraft, the gunner first had to visually identify the type of hostile aircraft. Turning the target size knob changed the projected reticle, with the current size setting shown in feet at the 12 o'clock position on the circle. Once the gunner aligned the center dot of the reticle with the center of the enemy aircraft, they turned the range wheel on the gun sight until the target's wings filled the circle. Keeping the target aligned required smooth tracking movements along both vertical, elevation, and horizontal, azimuth, axes. The gunner adjusted the sight vertically by rotating hand wheel grips on the frame and moved it horizontally by rotating the gun sight across the torso. Friction settings allowed the gunner to fine-tune the resistance of the sight's movement. Every movement in elevation or azimuth activated the respective turret and gun motions electrically. The system relied on two amplodyne generators to power the motors moving the cannons. These worked with a servo amplifier and differential Selsen generators at both the gun sight and gun positions. Except for the tail mount, all turrets could rotate 360 degrees and elevate to a 90-degree angle from the aircraft fuselage. Firing was controlled not by traditional triggers, but by buttons adjacent to the hand wheels, pressed by the gunner's thumbs. When the left hand gripped the wheel, it pressed an action switch that allowed the gun sight to control its turrets. If this switch wasn't pressed such as if the gunner was incapacitated, the sighting station was automatically deactivated and control passed to another gunner's station, regardless of electrical switch settings, ensuring continuous turret operability. During combat, the gunner simply needed to size, range, and track the enemy target using the gun sight. The Central Fire Control CFC system maneuvered the cannons while the computer constantly calculated all necessary aiming corrections to ensure accuracy. With these computer-aided adjustments, the guns had an effective range of 900 yards, which was more than double that of most enemy fighter weapons and 50% farther than manually aimed guns. The computer introduced corrections by adjusting the parallel mirrored movements between the gun sight and the guns themselves using the Selsen system. Lead, parallax, and ballistic corrections were all added independently to produce the final firing solution. To account for bullet deflection caused by wind and gravity, ballistic corrections were included, especially important when firing from a moving aircraft traveling around 250 miles per hour. Because the guns were positioned at various points along the aircraft's length, parallax corrections compensated for the distance between each gun sight and the respective gun barrels. Lead corrections accounted for the distance a moving target would travel during the bullet's flight. To perform these calculations, the computer required several data inputs from multiple sources. These included the range to the target as set by the gunner, the current azimuth and elevation of the gun sight, the aircraft's true airspeed, altitude and outside temperature as reported by the navigator, and the target's relative velocity, which the gunner estimated with two gyroscopes mounted on the gun sight. Depending on the kind of parallax involved, different computer models were used. 
a single parallax computer, such as the General Electric 2 CH1C1, was used at stations where the gun sight aligned with a single turret, like the nose or tail gunner stations. For stations like the top and side gunners, where two turrets had differing distances from the sight, double parallax computers like the 2 CH1D1 were installed. Although these stations could only operate two turrets at once, the side gunners could control up to three different turrets using a control switching mechanism. The computer itself was electromechanical, performing calculations mechanically even though it received electrical input. Vacuum tube-based calculators were impractical due to their size, heat output, and power requirements. Electrical data was converted to mechanical motion using Celsons and potentiometers. The computing unit was about the size of a suitcase, weighing over 50 pounds, and housed multiple interconnected modules. The ballistic computing unit was programmed with constants such as gravity, muzzle velocity, and caliber of the Browning M2.50 caliber projectile. It calculated corrections based on the gun's position, firing angle, target range, altitude, and air temperature, all of which affected air density and bullet drag. True airspeed also influenced windage. Meanwhile, the parallax computing unit was programmed with the exact distance between each gun sight and the turrets it controlled. It needed to know the target's range and the gun location at any given time in order to calculate the parallax correction using trigonometry. The target's relative velocity, range, and ballistic characteristics, all of which affected the projectile's arrival time at the target, were then used by the lead calculating unit to compute the lead correction. The computer's output, which was the parallel signal from the gun sight, Selsun modified for the sum of the three computed corrections, was sent to a servo amplifier, also known as the feedback controller. This controller drove two gun positioning motors, one for elevation and one for azimuth. As a result, the computer's corrections caused the turret and gun positions to deviate from what would have otherwise been a direct parallel alignment with the gun sight. Since the computers were electrically connected, they did not need to be physically close to the gun sights or turrets. The nose gunner's computer was located in the forward pressurized cabin behind the pilot's armor, while the other four computers were located under the floor in the radar operator's compartment toward the back of the middle pressurized cabin, protected by armor. In case of malfunction or battle damage, an override on the gun sight's retractable flip-down peep sight allowed the gunner to operate the cannons without computer correction. According to records maintained by the U.S. Army Air Forces, a total of 3,760 superfortresses were delivered. Boeing produced about 70% of them at its Renton, Washington, and Wichita, Kansas facilities, while the Glen L. Martin Company in Omaha, Nebraska, and Bell Aircraft in Marietta, Georgia, built the rest. After construction, the targeting computers and weapons were tested even though the aircraft wasn't yet combat ready. Bore sighting equipment was used with adjustment screws to first align the guns and turret to parallel target marks. Each turret was then synchronized with each controlling sighting station using a standardized harmonization target placed at least 100 feet away. Depending on the gun sight and turret combination, either the Selsun at the sighting station or the one at the turret was adjusted. All the targeting computers, input systems, and calculation components were tested using an advanced testing unit featuring more than 50 dials, meters, and switches. Once weapons and sighting stations had been harmonized, production rapidly exceeded the manufacturer's ability to install the central fire control systems, which threatened to delay deployment of otherwise combat-ready bombers. To address this, the USAAF, began training its own staff. Corporal Robert W. Bob Truxell of Lansing, Michigan, was among the first to graduate from the B-29 CFC and computer training programs at Lowry Field in Denver, Colorado. After a three-month battle with rheumatic illness forced him to leave Air Cadet Pilot School, he was reassigned to aircraft armament training, specializing as a turret mechanic for remote systems. His illness, though unfortunate, proved to be a twist of fate 
as most of his former air cadet unit was killed during the bombing raid on the Ployesht oil refineries in Romania on August 1, 1943. Truxell had previously studied trigonometry at General Motors Institute in Flint, Michigan, which qualified him for the 16-week B-29 CFC specialist course. After finishing his training, he earned a third stripe and was accepted into targeting computer school. He eventually became a rockar for a staff sergeant and led the first graduating class. Their first mission took place in Georgia. Truxell recalls using a fire extinguisher to clear civilians sleeping in the pressurized tunnels of the bombers so his team could access aircraft sections. They were assigned to the Bell Aircraft B-29 factory in Marietta, Georgia, where completed bombers stretched in a mile-long line awaiting gun turret and computer alignment. Once this backlog was resolved, the team moved from base to base, jumping ahead of squadrons awaiting deployment. When one squadron was cleared, they moved to the next. Truxell described the work as a relatively safe and interesting job. For Japanese fighter pilots, however, flying became far less exciting and far more dangerous because of the B-29's innovative gunnery system. According to the Army Air Force's Statistical Digest published in December 1945, in more than 31,000 combat sorties flown between August 1944 and August 1945, B-29s destroyed 9,914 enemy aircraft while losing only 72 of their own to enemy fighters. Gregory A. Henry of Chattanooga, Tennessee contributed this account to the history of World War II with assistance from the B-29-B-24 Squadron of the Commemorative Air Force in Fort Worth, Texas, and Dave Santos of the New England Air Museum in Windsor Locks, Connecticut. Thank you for reading this remarkable account of innovation, resilience, and service during World War II. Stories like these remind us of the extraordinary efforts behind every mission and every machine. For more first-hand experiences, untold tales, and deep dives into the history of the Second World War, be sure to follow and stay tuned to WW2 Stories, where history lives on through the voices of those who lived